something malicious. So these are, um, that's another problem that um, I think will uh, get more attention in the future. Um, there's a lot of timing-based attacks um, where, say for instance, you're, you're w-getting a file from the server and um, it subsequently gets another file on that server and the JavaScript itself says, you know, there's a two second period between each request. If you request it at one second period, the server can deny your request. Um, the client, um, the client can also uh, use timing within the JavaScript so that if you don't respect the timing loops, then it will decode incorrectly. And finally, the, um, you, they can introduce infinite loops so that it never finishes evaluating um, in the case that it detects an incorrect version. Or, um, you know, these are, these are ways to prevent, um, prevent us from finding what's actually there. So um, the, the final technique of preventing detection is actually using browser plugins and other, uh, other techniques that can be used to load JavaScript. In the case of um, SWF files, they actually pass it back to the browser and the browser will execute the JavaScript. Um, in the case of PDF files, it will uh, it contains its own JavaScript engine, which uh, Adobe has released on, on the second link there. Um, so a lot of improved um, obfuscation PDF files this year that I've seen also. We've talked about what the attacker's goal is. Um, we're going to talk about what, what's available to a defender. So you could open the script in a browser, modify it, um, replace things, and print out the contents of the decoded con um, what would be decoded. Um, this is really not an effective te technique anymore because too many scripts are using um, basically checks against the content. Um, so you could take an MD5 sum of the content, compare it against a predefined value, and then determine if it has been modified. So you can get around this uh, by using either a, an actual interpreter, uh, which is SpiderMonkey, or using um, various debuggers, which execute in the context of the browser. So you don't actually modify the scripts. So this is kind of important to do. And then finally, um, you could also, uh, there are several projects that have modified the JavaScript engine itself to extract information and variables. So these are some implementations similar to JSON Pack, and um, they're slightly different in that my, my main goal is to make it quick and also to make it very lightweight. In the case of WebAwet, it actually uses a real browser. And um, the, that wouldn't be effective if you're trying to, to, trying to do it against every URL on a, a corporate network. So definitely check these out. If So here are a variety of different um, different types of decoding techniques that you could take. Um, in the case of very simple scripts, you could just write your own decoder, translate, and figure that, um, figure that out that way. But once you um, get to the dynamic versions of those, they use the environment variables, they use HTML, um, they use the PDF uh, format, um, a, ver a variety of these different things. So, um, and then finally, the the most difficult uh, using server side defenses 
and determining the versions you're running and tracking your IP address. Um, basically, in the, the most difficult case, the best, the best, uh, best thing for you to do is actually visit it in a, a virtual machine or visit it like an actual user would. So there's really two, two different solutions here. Um, you could go after the full environment, put, it, put all of your tools to hook the browser, or you could do it strictly on the network side and watch um, passively as um, these scripts go by so that you don't have to worry about um, you know, these, these detection and difficult problems. So this is, the source code is based upon SpiderMonkey and Python. The Python controls the SpiderMonkey program, which is the, the JavaScript interpreter. And this is the, the source code that I've basically released. And it basically has a JavaScript part, which defines the environment. It set ups all the hooks. And um, there's also a file which does the pro post processing and part of the detection. Uh, what this does is. After the script executes, it will uh, look through the current defined variables and look for shellcode and URLs that were defined in any variables. And the Python part of this is the detection library based upon um, Yara signatures and also PDF, uh, SWF, uh, JavaScript decoding and the main engine itself. <coughs> so the first main new feature is the network decoding. Um, you can pass either a network interface or a PCAP file and the the preferred technique is a PCAP file because um, you don't have to run as root. And um, I think a lot of the, the benefit of uh, the active mode is you can, you can fetch any decoded URLs. And for instance, if it was shellcode and your actual browser didn't download the shellcode because it wasn't vulnerable, then this will go and download the shellcode or any other discovered URLs. Um, so in that case, you can get the best of both worlds. Um, you can also process scripts or uh, files that you have locally with this. So a couple challenges I tried to solve um, when using the network version. Um, fragmentation uh, with IP packets and also TCP re reassembly um, and uh, pipeline request where there's multiple uh, get or post requests in the same packet or in the same stream. And additionally, um, processing of gzip and chunked encoding. I didn't do anything for SSL. Uh, and then find, uh, after we extract all these streams, we still have to do the JavaScript decoding. So the pre.js file is largely responsible for this. And additionally, you could um, I do recommend modifying SpiderMonkey to take advantage of an eval hook. Um, so to enumerate the, the environment of a real browser or the PDF engine, um, I use a, everything is treated as an object. So you can go through every 